All right. Well, welcome to Neurochino on this Monday morning. Today we have Ma present a paper to us. Uh, she is currently visiting us in Bordeaux for, um, well, currently for an entire year <laughs> to, as part of her postdoc. Um, and she was, before that, she was at the University of Granada. And we are excited to have her with us today. And she's presenting a paper. I don't even know what it is. Big surprise of exciting science today. Um, just a quick recap before I give you the floor. Neurochino is an online journal club that is open to everyone. So everyone uh, is welcome to read a paper, a book, a book chapter. Um, and if it excites you, come and talk to us about it and tell us why it did. And we discuss it to the best of our knowledge. The only thing we ask that is not your own research, because we all think our own research is extremely exciting. <laughs> Right, without further ado, Ma, if you want to share the link in the chat here so I can copy it over on YouTube as well. And for everyone who's watching us over on YouTube, feel free to um, write your questions in the chat and I will then bring them into the Zoom meeting to ask you. Hi, good morning. Can I copy later the link? Because I'm, I have my paper in Mendeley, so I don't have the link right now. Uh, can you can you give us the title so I yeah. can find the link? Yeah, it's easier uh, for people to have the paper on the side as well. Yeah, one second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen, right? Yes. So the title is Consciousness and Cognition in Plants. Well, I'm already intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I have chosen this uh, paper, uh, first of all, because it's about cognition with, uh, sorry, con consciousness, which is uh, one of the main topic of my research. And second, because uh, recently I got very interested because uh, for cognition in plants, we were lucky enough to have this researcher, Paco Calvo, which is from the University of Murcia, and we invite him to, um, to give a talk, uh, in a, we were doing like some talks in bars about uh, psychology for the general public. So we invited him and it was an amazing talk and I get very interested. So now I'm seeing some uh, documentaries and, and reading some books about cognition in plants and I guess it's amazing. So when I found this paper about consciousness and cognition in plants, I, I, I feel that I needed to read it and present it to you. So I hope you like as much as I did. And um, so well, the, the main of it's a review. And the main objective of this paper is not to say that we know that plants are conscious, but it's saying that uh, we cannot deny at this point that this is a possibility. So plants could be conscious. So um, they talk of consciousness. Uh, well, there are many definitions of consciousness, but in this case, um, they consider that can be uh, that plants could have uh, feelings or subjective states or uh, awareness of the events and including the awareness of their own internal states. And uh, well, we for many time they have it has been believed that plants are very simple organisms that only responds to in a very simple way, like very determined. But uh, recently we are um, discovering that they have very complex cognitive um, abilities and behaviors. So in the first part of the paper. Um, they are showing these uh, recent findings about plant cognition, and I want to uh, go through them uh, quickly. So, for example, um, they have been shown that plants are able to communicate in the plant level. So, for example, between the roots and the leaves or the branches, and also interplants. So, they can communicate with other plants. And they do so by these uh, iron biogenetic volatile organic compounds that they um, rise to the air and they can um, ad adwar other plants that, for example, they are going to suffer an attack from an insect. Um, 
They also communicate through vibration, and this is, uh, has been recently discovered, and they don't know exactly how it works, but it seems that they can vibrate, and this vibration could be another kind of communication between them and with other animals. And um, they also have like a very huge network with, this, uh, with their um, roots, and also with uh, the fungi. So the fungi has like little, little roots that, um, that are in a big network that communicate the whole uh, forest. Um, they also have kin recogni uh, recognition and they can discriminate between kin and non-kin uh, plants. Um, they also um, have decision making, but not only like in a very simple way, but they can take into account like many uh, situations, like the temperature, um, the, um, the humidity, the nutrients, uh, the light, and they integrate all this information to, be, to make the, the best um, choice for their survival. Um, they also have anticipatory behavior, so they can kind of anticipate the future. For example, there are some kind of plants that reorient during the night to be faced in the direction of the sunrise in the morning. Um, they also have learning and memory, uh, which I think it's really amazing. So they show uh, habituation and they also show classical conditioning and it is long lasting. So after 28 days, they, they still have this uh, learning, this classical conditioning learning. Um, what else? They, uh, I found this, um, this uh, investigation very interesting. So they also evaluate or they have risk sensitivity. So when they have to make a choice, they take into account the risk. And in this investigation, for example, uh, when a plant uh, was given with uh, different pots in which uh, it can rise, um, if there is enough nutrients in one, the, it choose that one, but if there is not enough nutrients for living, then it will choose the, the pot in which the nutrients level are changing. So it's like, okay, I'm taking the risk of this uh, um, variable um, environment because the other one is not enough for living. Um, they also have the ability of mimicry, which is an ability of uh, changing the shape and the color uh, to, to be like another organism, for example, what they uh, what chameleons do. Uh, so there are plants that can do this. So they change um, the color and the shape uh, and the shape of the leaves to be uh, as another plant, usually the plant that they uh, grow around. So they grow over other plant, so they mimic this, um, this other plant. And uh, they can do it even in the absence of physical contact. So some researchers think that maybe they have a uh, uh, protovision, because otherwise, who, uh, how could they uh, mimicry uh, if there is no physical contact? And they also have um, the ability to estimate and process quantity magnitudes uh, in time and also in period of time. For example, uh, the carnivorous plant, they don't close like the mouth anytime that something is touching them because this will be a waste of energy. So only when something is touching them in a... Um, a number of times, so more than two times in a short interval, interval of time, they will close and they reset this cycle uh, after a while. Um, what I really think is very amazing too is that, is that they have like a collaborative behavior, so they don't work in a, um, in a competitive way if not in a collaborative way. So for example, uh, if in a forest one tree is ill and it, because it's, uh, it's been attacked by the other insect um, and it cannot take the enough nutrients because it's ill, uh, the other um, trees of the forest will um, give uh, it the nutrient that they need. 
because if this tree dies, it's bad for all the forest. Because if a tree uh, die, they will uh, it will make a hole in the forest. Then the sun will get the the soil. The soil will get dry, and this is bad for all the communities. So they have uh, this communication through the network of, of roots, and they help each other. So, well, this is the review of the cognitive abilities that they have been discovering recently. Uh, so these researchers, um, they uh, suggest that we could talk about a plant neurobiology. So there are researchers who are against this terminology because they don't think it's, um, they, we can speak about neurobiology of plants. But there is, uh, because they don't have a neural system, but the, these researchers, what they say is that even if they don't have a neural system, they have uh, something quite similar to uh, the neural system that we know. So, for example, they have neurotransmitters, they, uh, they have other kind of cells that are very similar to neurons and they respond electrically. Um, they can generate action potentials, and they also get uh, plants also get uh, under the effects of anesthesia. And they propose that the vascular system could be like this, um, that, like the nervous system, like a long distance communication uh, system. So they think that it is worthy to talk about a neurobiology of plants. And uh, well, in this uh, four um, part, they talk about different theories of consciousness and which are the, the ones that could be more related or could explain more um, consciousness in plants, but I'm not going to through them because it's a long um, paragraph. Uh, so I will skip up to the conclusion. So. Uh, because I don't want to run out of the time. So basically what they propose is, as, they, I, as I say at the beginning, we cannot deny that it's possible that plants are conscious. And um, there are two reasons that usually people uh, or researchers say to deny the possibility of consciousness in plants. So one of them is that they are very simple organisms that are like uh, genetically and environmentally uh, determined. But we know now that they have a very uh, intelligent and adaptive behavior. So if we um, assume that they have cognitive ability, why could they don't have uh, consciousness too? And the second argument that usually uh, people give is that they don't have a nervous system. But uh, first of all, we uh, don't know if actually having a nervous system is a prerequisite for being conscious. And also in the second place, uh, even if they don't have a nervous system, they, they have some structures that are quite similar uh, or similar enough to a neural system and could be supporting consciousness, at least um, maybe in a different way um, as the consciousness that we can know and imagine. So yeah, this is all. Thank you, this is really exciting. Um, and also thanks for taking us out of our comfort zone um, to a new field, it's absolutely fantastic. Questions. Who has questions? <laughs> no one? Uh, Michel. Um, you know, like, uh, uh, thank you. It was absolutely great. I really had a good time. There's no better way to start a Monday morning. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you know, like there is always this question in people studying consciousness. So like, how do you measure consciousness? Some people like measure it as a reportability of the events and some other are going deeper into those level of consciousness. How would you, how would you rationalize, you know, what would be the, a good experiment to do measures of like threshold of consciousness in plants? How would you do that? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, for example, in, uh, in one documentary, I was uh, watching that plants um, 
why they grow like um, straightforward and they are not bended. And uh, it's because they, they, have, uh, they process the light, so they grow up to the light. Second, they can feel also like the, the hair, I don't know how to say, the gravity of the hair. And third is because they have also, because in the absence of the light and in the absence of the feeling of the gravity, they also um, can grow straight. So um, the researchers were demonstrating that they have like um, feeling of their own shape. So for me, this could be a kind of consciousness because they are aware of their own shape. So for me, this um, experiment could be a way of demonstrating that they have a kind of consciousness, even if not, if not um, awareness of stimuli. I think Valentina is very interested by that, so. I'm oh, sorry? Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, Valentina raised her hand, she's working on, on body ah. awareness, so she's, she's super interested by that. Yeah, is it really awareness or is it um, a response to a stimuli? Um, the, the one that, that I was telling? Yeah, the one that, the one that you were referring to. No, because in this experiment, they, they have like different explanations. So the first one, the light, and then demonstrate that it's not only the light, then the gravity, and then they, demo it dem they demonstrate that it's not only gravity. So the third uh, explanation was that they have an own feeling of their own shape because they, there was the only explanation that was uh, resting. So, but, uh, and this feeling can be different within species, um, plants. I don't know. And uh, the question was, can we really speak about consciousness? Should we um, use the same um, definitions uh, that we use for uh, mammals, for animals, or uh, we should uh, build a, a whole new way to express this uh, phenomenon? Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's probable that it's not exactly as our consciousness. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if actually there is consciousness in plants, no? but for me, uh, I will say that it's probably not the same way, but also with animals, probably, uh, probably there are many animals with uh, some kind of consciousness, but maybe it is not exactly the same as our consciousness. So, but I don't know if created a, a new uh, definition, it's um, a good thing, but maybe to adapt or to, to realize that there are other ways of intelligence. Because our mean, our explanation of intelligence is so anthropocentric. So there are other ways of intelligence. I mean, we are going to extinguish uh, ourselves, and plants have been living for thousands and thousands of years. So maybe they are more intelligent than we are. Yeah, in a different <laughs> in a different way, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Okay. Uh, if, if I can jump in here, I, I think the idea of or discussing whether we should apply any terminology is quite interesting, but it probably depends on where you stand. If you are pro neurobiology of plants, then you probably are happy to apply the terminology that we currently use mm -hmm. for mammals. Whereas if you are on the other side of the spectrum and you're like, no, absolutely not, then yes, that necessitates a new language to communicate, mm -hmm. I guess. My take on it. Valentina has nothing to add to that. <laughs> no, okay. I won't, um, I, won't, I won't say which side of the spectrum I am. <laughs> oh, I know which side you're on. <laughs> no need to say, you gave it away. <laughs> right, um, I think Leo was first with a question. Yeah, you um, were going in the direction uh, um, of, indeed, like I wanted to say that for me, uh, the beginning, it was confusing this uh, terminology 
of uh, neurobiology. So they, I was thinking, but they don't have neurons. They <laughs> were in the beginning, and and then you discussed it then. But I was really like uh, amazed by how it's uh, what we, we could say like a simpler uh, system. It's actually efficient, as you explained. And that is uh, really interesting uh, in the um, like in the perspective of like uh, complex systems. And then, as you can say, like, as you said, like in other form of intelligence. So I think that uh, we should be definitely open to a thing that is not just a response to stimuli. But for me, it's really like uh, it's a little driving, um, like difficult to think about consciousness because I think it's we are forcing our system uh, to another system. Like uh, so, uh, yeah. For me, it's uh, I would say that uh, it's really interesting to uh, study this uh, communication because it's a communication. But yeah, to be careful. For me, it was a bit confusing to apply our system to something that is obviously different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this researcher is getting funding from the ar uh, the army of the states mm -hmm. uh, because they they are putting money there because they think the the plants has a very different ways in which they can solve problems. Mm -hmm. We have a very um, biological uh, or animal way of solving problems and and open our minds to other kind of uh, behaviors and intelligent behaviors. They think it could be very useful for going to the space and these things. So they are putting money there. So yeah, I am, I am, I agree in that uh, we don't need to, this system fit in what we know. So it's like the opposite, like open our minds that there are other ways of uh, to be intelligent or to solve problems. And actually it's really interesting in the perspective also like alternative energies or uh, alternatives to what we are doing that uh, is obviously not really good sometimes. So I think mm. it's super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if I can jump in, I, I thanks for a really interesting presentation. Um, I have no resistance for the idea that plants would have consciousness. And uh, I really like how, you know, a lot of, function, cognitive function that were previously thought to be purely animal or human are, are slowly being extended to, to what we thought of as lower species, similarly to what has been done with, uh, you know, birds that now has primate level uh, uh, behavioral capacities. Um, but I think it's really important, and I think it's been discussed to distinguish, like consciousness, they may very well have it, and I don't think we have any evidence against, but I would like to know how to test it because experimentally, because consciousness, you can, no matter the, the complexity, you're able to have self-representation, your ability to represent space, to compute the most complex cognitive function, even if, and, and the you don't need necessarily consciousness for that. And, and this will be the case even for machine learning. Um, again, I, I actually think that one day machine learning may, artificial intelligence may reach consciousness, but this said, I think you can reach human level intelligence um, behaviorally without needing consciousness. And, and consciousness is more about um, having a subjective experience, not about information processing. And this is very hard then to test when a, when a, a plant cannot talk or, and, and I think it's fascinating. How do you test that? What's the heuristic behind it? How do you test that? there is an experience separate from the processing, an eye inside the plane watching what's going on, because this is really what is consciousness in the end. And it's fascinating. So, so there's just a, maybe a comment, but if you have any more suggestion on how you could really test consciousness, you know, beyond just cognitive ability, uh, I think it would be really interesting to hear any, any comment on that. Yeah, that was the same question that Michelle and I don't have like the, the answer, but it's true that there are also other theories of consciousness for which uh, they explain consciousness in a different way. For example, the one from Tononi, which is plain consciousness like uh, integration of information, like only that way, like the integration, well, it's not so simple, the theory, but uh, it's more like inter, uh, inform, integration of information. So yes, I, what I mean is that um, there are 
many types of uh, consciousness and maybe the, the subjective feeling or the feeling of you are an, an individual in the, in the world, maybe this kind of consciousness is not present, but maybe there are other kind of consciousness or type of consciousness. I, I'm, I'm quite sure that they have the, their own uh, state feeling, like they, they have to, to have it like um, to know how they are because they feel when they are being attacked, uh, attacked by insects and so on, uh, or when they have a damage. So this is a, another way of consciousness. And but this, so maybe I would challenge that maybe in the sense that you can have an aversive or going, you know, uh, let's say a positive or negative reaction to environment as a survival program. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you are aware of what's going on in a, in a you know, separate from that response system. It, maybe if, I think what you make allusion uh, is, is the, a bit the binding theory of consciousness, where basically we have all these separate sensory information going from various channels in your brain. And then how come we still feel we are one person? How come... You know the, the color and shape and speed of what you perceive uh, separately are they integrated? You talk about integration into one, and and there, one thought is that consciousness is one way to do it, mm -hmm. but I think that there could be another way that's not relying on consciousness to do the same thing. And uh, and I'm just challenging and wondering whether plants have it or not. But I, I'd love if they had it. I think it would be absolutely incredible. But um, um, if you just I think and if defining consciousness as just integration, I think it's a bit dangerous because then it removes a little bit of what consciousness, the specific of consciousness, a lot of things are integration. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's very complex. Uh, we, we, are, we have not the solution for uh, humans, so it's very hard to find it in, in plants. But yeah, actually the researchers, what they say is that we cannot say that they are conscious, but uh, we, we cannot deny that they are. I'm, I'm sorry, they are knocking the door. <laughs> One second. Oh, that's a first. <laughs> I was thinking that it could be like interesting to like compare uh, to this kind of res I'm experiment sorry. response uh, with different kind of uh, plants um, because was in the different uh, like uh, ecosystems uh, the comparison in that because like if we use our system to measure I think we really need to explore their system so the comparison between plants uh, can maybe give some like it like um, input of our, how to measure those things because we actually don't know. So we just need to observe like in a machine learning approach, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wanna try and jump on like the integration and tononi, but so, you know, I've always been surprised how like plants look like neurons. Um, um, if you if you change, you know, you do this mental experiment, you change your resolution, you project yourself in the cortex and you're like very tiny, then you are like in a forest of neurons. But you'll never say that a single neuron is conscious. And that's really through the interaction between these neurons that like there is an imagined property that we call consciousness. So maybe we cannot really measure consciousness at the single plant level, but at a collective level, uh, by taking many measurements and modeling the signal, we can see phenomenon of like uh, integration, but also observe, you know, a form of awareness through the reaction to different stimuli or what is happening in, in the environment. So in this way, you have the communication and you can see like, you know, how communication diffuses and there is exchange and there is this, you know, this concept and this biological observation of we and tree, and you have this loop of information where, you know, you have like this manipulation of the information that leads you to something more. I like what you said about emerging property. Um, I'm wondering whether if you could model, if we have a deep biochemical understanding of, of, uh, of whole plants compute all that cognition and... Mm but you realize that there is still something missing to explain 
information processing that really you need an emerging property that's just not explained by your yeah. reductionist thing that could give you a hint that there's something else that we're completely missing. Yeah, uh, I don't know if mathematically people have been expanding on the Gesha theory, but I, I guess some people do. There is like, um, there was those equation with the entropy and calculation. I think that I had a postdoc working a little bit on that that showed that you could actually see how you have more when you have the walls and when you have the sum of the parts, which is a fundamental thinking behind the Gesha theory. Uh, but I don't remember exactly how it worked. So <laughs> I just mm, explain. Yeah, there must be something. <laughs> but could it also just be a matter of opera? Okay, I'm not going to use that word on a Monday morning. It's too difficult to <laughs> come up with a standardized way of um, assessing and measuring. So consciousness, even in the human literature, is quite a messy terminology. Um, and different people mean different things by using the term. Then measuring it is very difficult because, as Michelle mentioned in the very beginning, what's the target outcome that we actually consider as being conscious? Is it uh, being aware of stimuli? Is it the right response to something? Is it something a lot more subtle? And then um, when it comes to plants, I mean, the most common myth, belief, whatever you want to call it, is that plants respond to music, right? So if you play, I think it was Mozart or Bach, they grow faster. And if you play something like techno or hard rock, they grow slower. Um, so oh, I can see from your faces that some people have not heard of this. <laughs> Apparently it's a thing, I never tried it. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the, the question that I wanna get to is if they react to music, that's a reaction to a stimuli like to light or oxygen or nutrients in the soil. But like in terms of the evolution of plants and the evolution of consciousness, why would they respond to a stimuli that's completely out of their normal system, for example. So the point being that maybe the measurements that we have, we still need to fine tune on both sides, the, the human cognition side, but especially when it comes to plant cognition. Any thoughts? I mean, the music thing could relate to the, um, the fact that plants can detect vibration. And if I heard correctly, which is very new to me, maybe you did emit vibration which is more surprising to me but the music thing might be just could it be just related to the rhythm and, and the ability to take vibration which is normally useful for insect detection and things like that yeah for example they use the vibration to communicate uh, the with the flies and with the bees and they, they respond to the frequency of the vibration of the of the um of the bees for example Good point. Um, another question I had was, um, sorry, Mish. Okay. Um, so you you talked about they have a feeling. She's gone. Well, I'm gonna ask you guys. <laughs> so that feeling of a shape and the recognition of keen, i.e., supporting plants that are closer to them. Or as a comment on YouTube also said that there are some studies showing that mother trees support their kids in the forest. So that relationship to Keen. I was wondering if there is a critical threshold of how big that group can be or how big that forest can be so it's still supported. Um, and also what happens, so let's, let's say we come in and do some deforestation. Is that like brain surgery in our case where you come in and you chop off a part of the connections? Does it have any impact on the forest? It's a question to me because I... I it's yeah. an open question. I'm not even sure anyone here has the answer to it, but it was just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I have what I have read is that, of course, that uh, isolated uh, trees, um, they have in a 
um, harder condition to survive than the ones that are connected. And of course, if in a forest you you cut the half of the forest, um, you 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 damage everything because you the all the ecosystem that the forest is, is has has created you you destroy. It. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. They they uh, and actually, why your plants in your home usually die because they are alone. They they cannot uh, to to uh, to tell other people that uh, to other plants that they are going to be attacked. They cannot defend between each other. They can, but uh, when they are in the street, they, they usually grow much easily. It's the only and, way and, they can. And I have to say, I'm not an expert of plants okay but i'm just reading recently yeah so if, if you flip that around so you say my plants die because they can't communicate to each other what if my plants do not die but they're actually their roots are completely separated in different pots scattered around the house is there another way of them for them to communicate or is it just through roots no 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 they can communicate through through this volatile uh, components so well i i suppose that not all plants have the same way, but uh, some plants can communicate through some something that they um, rise to the air, and yeah, they use this thing also to communicate with uh, the insects. For example, if they are suffering an attack from an insect, they can uh, rise these uh, substances that attract to the to the animal that is uh, eating this animal that is attacking them, for example. So they say, hey, help. And they um, call this another animal to help them. So yes. In that case, my plants are talking to my dog because he loves <laughs> to chew the leaves. <laughs> right, um, clearly this was extremely exciting because we ran massively over time. <laughs> so feel free for everyone who wants to uh, start their Monday uh, work day uh, to uh, leave us here. And for everyone who wants to continue the discussion, I just keep the chat open for a little bit longer. Um, thank you for joining us. Have an exciting week in science. And just a quick reminder, on Thursday, we have a CNS talk on sleep and consciousness. So we have a week of consciousness for you lined up. Um, until then, have an exciting week in science. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot for organizing. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.